Okay, let's do this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A nice and bright Friday here in the DC area. My name is Shujo Sen. I am a program officer with the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, I am happy to welcome you all to this webinar about a very recently released uh, notice of funding opportunity for faculty members who are teaching undergraduate and master students genomics and data science. We are, we are very, very excited to tell you what we have in mind for you over here. So going right into this, I want to lay out a little bit of the structure of this uh, webinar. Uh, the first piece of this will be me presenting uh, information on the funding opportunity, and then we will open it up for questions and answers. This is a Zoom webinar, which means that uh, we don't have a voice function for the questions. Please uh, type them into the Q&A box. Uh, you don't have to tell us who you are. We don't have chat on this because that sort of distracts us from answering questions that are coming in in real time. But if you want to send in your questions using the Q&A box, we will definitely make sure that we answer these and put a FAQ section on the website for this opportunity. Uh, finally, this webinar is also being recorded and we will post a recording later on to catch any pieces that you missed. Uh, I want to start with sharing these links. Once again, these slides, along with any other information from today, will also go on their website, so you don't have to be uh, taking screenshots uh, at this point. Uh, all of these links will be available later. The first link is this funding opportunity itself that I just mentioned. Uh, the second one is a U24 hub that is a close companion to this uh, funding opportunity, uh, along with other things that I'll talk about, such as NGRI's strategic vision, uh, which lays out a map for genomics in the next decade and our diversity action plan, which, uh, which sort of describes how we want to broaden the genomics workforce. Uh, so once again, let me start by giving you a little bit of an outline. Uh, I will do a little bit of background and purpose, uh, telling you why we decided to do this uh, funding opportunity as well as the other one I mentioned in the hub. Uh, a little bit about the approach, what sort of work are we looking to solicit through these applications? And then maybe many of you are familiar with the NIH funding process, but maybe some of you are first time applicants. So I will cover bits and pieces of the application process. Although I should emphasize that the funding opportunity itself is the place where you have all of the information needed. So not everything will uh, get covered on this webinar. So go back and read that a couple more times. And then if I do this quickly enough, then we will have tons of time left over for questions and answers. So quickly, I want to give you the local landscape here at NIH and the Human Genome Research Institute. Within our institute, we have two offices that work very closely together. Uh, for education in genomics and education in data science. I belong in NAGRI's Office of Genomic Data Science, or OGDS. Uh, my colleague Lucia Hindorf and others are in our close cousin, the NAGRI TIDE Office, that's Training Diversity and Health Equity Office, which is the home for all of the activity that is educational or career development or training funding through our institute. So everything you see today will be a collaborator is a collaboration between these two offices and these websites have lots of information about other things we are doing in our offices for education. So I, I encourage you to go back and look at these websites at, at your leisure. Uh, of course, the other thing is that at this point, NIH has heavily invested in cloud computing uh, across multiple institutes. I am part of the Anvil platform at the Genome Institute, which I strongly recommend if you are anywhere in the genomic space as a source of data and tools and teaching resources. But it's not just Anvil. At this point, NIH has a broad spectrum of cloud platforms, Biodata Catalyst, uh, the NCI Data Commons, NLM has its own clouds. And really, we think that together, these clouds democratize access to computing resources uh, make it easy for people to access data and tools that would otherwise get siloed in institutional computers. And uh, more importantly than ever before, they enable, enable teaching and collaboration in a virtual space, even if your institutions are, are widely apart in a physical space. 
So with all of that, uh, the work in this funding announcement has its root in NAGRI's 2020 strategic vision. Uh, the strategic visions are published once every decade or so from our institute, sort of laying out a map for the next 10 years and where genomics could go. And in the last one, we specifically said that data science is now inextricably linked to genomics. So there is no genomics over the next two years, 10 years, unless we are also including data science. And that also means that we have to train people. Genomic data science is not something that at this one gets taught in any um, massive commonplace way. So NAGRI really is committed to increasing our training and workforce development activity in the intersection of data science and genomics. Uh, together with the strategic vision, we published what we refer to as the diversity action agenda. Once again, these links are all in that slide towards the beginning. The, and among other things, the action agenda is saying that we need to broaden and diversify our genomics workforce starting early on, starting at the undergraduate uh, masters or graduate levels so that future scientists are coming from all sections of society and also getting access to genomics early on in their careers and hopefully getting excited about what it can do for healthcare in, in their research uh, careers moving forward. So these are the two documents that are sort of the intellectual uh, platform for which all of the future work I'll describe is built upon. So in the particular context of genomic data science, our approach to this is through a mix of two funding opportunities to, to improve support for teaching and education and student research in this context. I'm going to talk about today two funding announcements. One, of course, the one that I we just released, but another one that was released last year and is about to be awarded. These will be referred to as the hub and the sites. You are probably here because you saw the sites funding announcement that is RFA AG 23002 released a few days ago, but the U24 educational hub, which I will also talk about is another funding announcement released last year that uh, we are just about to announce who the awardee is and let it be very clear from our perspective that we expect the sites and the hub to be partners in this educational and teaching space for genomics and data science. So think of everything as being a network coming out of NHGRI, the educational hub and the sites. So really, let's quickly talk about the hub. We funded this group uh, and we'll uh, in a day or so, we should be able to also tell you who they are to be sort of the community organizers and uh, the people that would lay the groundwork for teaching genomics and data science in smaller institutions or institutions with students from underrepresented backgrounds, really taking genomics into classrooms and taking data science into classrooms where it was not being supported otherwise. This is what we call a U24 cooperative agreement uh, which means that NIH and the awardee of the hub will be working very closely together to do this sort of community outreach and support for anyone curious to use the cloud in a genomics education context. Uh, once again, as I mentioned, uh, the primary activity here will be to engage stakeholders in education. That essentially means you, the faculty members that actually teach these topics and then do things like hosting cloud computing seminars, uh, genomic seminars, data science seminars, uh, collecting feedback on the challenges that you face as you teach these topics, uh, potentially training many of you if you would like to be given material to teach genomics. If you are, for example, a biology faculty member, but not a genomics person or a computer science teacher who is not a biology person. So really the hub is also a train the trainer uh, entity in that context. Also, we are very excited that the hub award includes money for faculty members like you to be funded for student research projects in, in your institutions. And I'll talk about that uh, in more detail over the next few slides. Uh, to be transparent, the hub is a partnership between NAGRI and others who are co-funding it. Uh, this is in a sense uh, coming from many different parts of NIH which of course speaks to the enthusiasm that NIH as a whole uh, is, is generating in this educational area. So now let's talk about the particular funding announcement that uh, I think most of you saw and are here about. 
This is RFA AG23002. It has a long name, which I won't talk about, except to say that we internally refer to this funding announcement as the SIPES. So once again, there's a theme, the hub and the SIPES. The overarching purpose of the SIPES program is to support faculty members at institutions which are historically educating students from URM or underrepresented minority backgrounds in the topics of genomics and data science and cloud computing. And really we are focusing on undergraduates and master's degree uh, students here because there are other funding opportunities that target doctoral students. So this is specifically once again for institutions that are historically serving URM students. And also there is a very, very targeted focus on using cloud platforms, not just the Anvil, but other NIH clouds as well as tools for education. So please keep in mind these two top level priorities for anything that we expect to come in as an application for this particular site's funding announcement. So what is the scope of work? Uh, we are hoping to support faculty members themselves. So rather than supporting student research or rather than supporting the creation of resources or institutional facilities, this funding announcement is designed to support faculty members to create educational content using the cloud for teaching these topics, computational genomics and data science, which we acronymize as CGDS. Once again, there is a focus on the undergraduate and master's degree levels here. Uh, we are also including within that concept, the idea of associate degrees. So community colleges, as I'll talk about later, are extremely welcome and encouraged. And even if your institution is not awarding undergraduate degrees, but is awarding associate degrees, you are absolutely in the space of what we hope to attract uh, through this funding announcement. The content that I just mentioned uh, will include not just classroom teaching material, but also hands-on labs in genomics and data science that will use the cloud as a classroom. So imagine the cloud being a virtual lab here. So we, we encourage you to use, or not encourage, we almost require that the cloud be used as a way of doing hands-on labs for your students in genomic data science. Once again, the site's awardees will receive support from the hub uh, in the second and third years of their awards to do student research projects. So not everything in here is about teaching alone. There is an opportunity which I'll describe in a future slide for you to be funded through the hub to design a student research project. That data will be collected at your institution. Your students will do that work. And once again, we expect that that data will go on the cloud as a way for them to learn how to use cloud computing uh, in a genomic data science context. Uh, there is a huge expectation that anything that comes out of this will get shared. Uh, NIH will make a number of awards, but we hope that data sharing and sharing of educational tools means that anything that gets built through this funding opportunity will get used by a much, much larger number of teaching faculty across many more institutions. So with that, let me talk about eligibility. There is a very, very specific purpose to this. Uh, this funding opportunity is targeted at a particular kind of institution. And we wrote these eligibility criteria to hopefully make it clear who is and who is not eligible to apply for this. So number one, your institution must have received uh, less than $25 million per year of R01 funding over the last three fiscal years. Uh, your institution must be awarding associates, undergraduate or master's degrees in biomedical sciences. And, and uh, I use the logical and operator. So it's not your institution has to qualify for all three of these bullets and not just one or two. There has to be a universal concurrence with all three. And the third bullet, of course, is that the institution itself has to have a documented historical our current mission to educate students from the populations that have been identified as underrepresented in biological research. NIH uses a particular definition of this, which is up in the funding announcement itself. But really, this is targeting what historically would have been called minority serving institutions. Uh, and in current NIH language, we use a longer definition of this, which you see on the screen. But this is not open to any and all applicants. This is limited to institutions that have a historical mission 
to educate URM students uh, of, um, of any different variety of URM students. So with that, let me talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about content. The funding itself is for faculty to create educational content that includes classroom lectures, instructional videos, interactive demonstra demonstrations, as well as hands-on cloud exercises in the topics of genomics and data science. So content is defined in a fairly broad way here. It's not just using uh, sticking to things like PowerPoint slides or traditional ways of teaching. Once again, the cloud has to be a big part of whatever gets built here. There are also a fairly wide range of scenarios that would not be considered responsive. Responsive in NIH language means something that is in is aligned with what we want to happen through this funding announcement. So please take time to go through what we list as the non-responsive applications because there are particular things that are genomics and data science, but still not going to be considered eligible for this particular funding announcement. For example, if something does not use the cloud as a teaching tool, it should not be applied for through this funding announcement. If something is going to propose just a research project but not teaching, that should not be considered responsive to this. So I won't read through this here, but please uh, pay attention to what we would consider non-responsive and uh, end up not even sending out to review if, if it gets uh, submitted as an application. Uh, once again, I mentioned that it's not just the educational content itself. There is uh, opportunity funds piece of this. Uh, opportunity funds in our world means a competitive uh, opportunity for awardees to get additional funds. So if someone applies to the sites and gets an award, what that means is above and beyond the money that the faculty member themselves received or the institution received, the U24 hub that I mentioned will also be awarding six uh, $50,000 student research project awards. And that money will go to the site's institution for the faculty member to design a genomics or data science project that their students will conduct, the data will get collected by that institution. And we hope that this gives a sense of ownership and participation to your students and makes it more than a classroom exercise or something that they are doing on the cloud without getting their hands on an actual experiment or an actual uh, scientific research project of sorts. Uh, this, how this would happen is up to you to design and make part of your applications, except for us to say that there has to be a plan for the cloud anvil or other clouds to be used as the place where you would analyze any data coming out of these student research projects. So with that, let me cover the application process because as I mentioned, many of you may be familiar, but I don't want to take it for granted that any, everyone on this call has applied for NIH funding before. The single biggest take home message is that if this application, this uh, funding opportunity seems attractive to you, please reach out to me so we can discuss your plans or how you want to use the money or how you want to design your application. Program officers like me love hearing early from our applicants rather than hearing a few days before the deadline about an idea that I could have told you before would either be really good or probably not as good uh, response to this one. So if you're intending to apply, send me an email and let's get on the on a Zoom call and let me give you some feedback on your idea. We love doing that. Okay, so the bulk of what you would end up writing is in what is called the PHS 398 research plan. That is a, a big part of the application itself. Uh, all of this is once again in that funding announcement, so I won't read through it except to tell you that the page limits are also linked in there. I believe it's 25 pages for this one, but uh, please go back and check exact regulations, uh, which NIH puts in a link. It is broken up into a number of sections that you see in these bullets. The biggest of these is actually the research program. Uh, that sort of describes the bulk of what you would plan or what you would propose to the reviewers for this. This once again has five sections within it, uh, overview of the content, uh, plans for how you would utilize NIH clouds, plans for how you would share this content. As I mentioned, this is uh, very, very much intended to be uh, available to the broader educational community. 
So your plans for sharing will be a big part of the review process. Uh, once again, also strategies for how you would use those $50,000 pots of money from the U24 hub for your student projects, and also a timeline describing how you would do this within the three-year award period for this funding announcement. Uh, please make sure to include these things. Uh, these are also listed out in the funding announcement, but I just wanted to emphasize a resource sharing plan. That's a standard NIH inclusion formats are available in the funding announcement. A plan for how you would apply to the opportunity funds announcement from the hub, a plan for how you would disseminate uh, and share everything coming out of this. And the letter of support here is at least an institutional letter of support that your institution and your department are behind this. Also, you may choose to collaborate with people and include individual letters of support as well from your collaborators. So finally, the, we'll get into how this gets reviewed. The initial level of review is classical NIH peer review, which uh, many of you may know that process. This will happen at a review panel that NAGRI convenes uh, later this year uh, in late fall or early winter. Uh, that review then gets condensed into something that we present to NAGRI's advisory council and they do a second level of review and tell us uh, what they think of our funding plans. And finally, the funding decisions themselves are actually based upon a combination of these reviews, as well as what uh, program officers decide is high priority from a program point of view, how much money Congress gave us that year, as well as the scientific and technical merit itself, which comes out of the review scores. So relevant deadlines, uh, the letter of intent is non-binding. You can completely choose to skip that uh, because it's just a few a week and a couple of days away from today. It's, it gives us a sense of how many people are interested, but it's certainly not a mandatory part of this. The application due date itself is October 10th. So we recognize that that is a short window of time. We are working to see if we can uh, make any changes and, and extend that a little bit. So keep, keep an eye out for that space. But otherwise, the biggest piece of advice I have is that do not wait until the day before that deadline to submit. We see all the time people that spend months writing an application only for a computer glitch or an internet outage to spoil their hard work and the application not make it in by the deadline. So if you want to apply, don't think of October 9th as being the day you want to do this. Uh, let, let's see if we can help you do it much earlier than that. With that, I'm going to wrap this up and open it up for questions. Um, Gerald, you tell me if I should keep my screen up or we can take the screen off and go to the chat. Sarah Hutchison, who is our fantastic program analyst, will call out your questions. If you have any, please use the chat function to start putting those in. Thank you for that great presentation, Jojo. I'll be helping facilitate this Q&A. It looks like we're still waiting for some questions to come in, but please, folks, if you have any, please submit through the Q&A. So Sarah, I see something that I'll grab while you round out the others. So do uh, anonymous attendee is asking, do we need to budget cloud computing cost in the budget? That is encouraged. It can be estimates. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact, uh, but definitely there is a piece of this that we are expecting to see how much money you would propose to use in a cloud educational context. Not completely linked to this funding announcement, but we are, we have done historically and maybe we will do again uh, funding opportunities that are just giving out pieces of money to use the cloud. So put it in the budget and if later on we can find ways to take that off your budget and maybe use that money for student projects or something else, we will do that. But definitely the short answer is yes, please include uh, in your applications a budget line item for cloud computing costs. Hey, our next question is asking about if the project should be master's level or undergraduate level. We could speak to that. 
Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm happy to see you here. The projects can be at undergraduate or master's level. They don't have to be masters. If you're teaching undergraduate class in genomic data science and you want to design a project which your undergraduate students as a group do together, that's fine as well. Of course, you know, master students quite commonly do research projects, but in this case, we encourage undergraduates just as much. Great. We also have a question if the program supports or has any limitations on collaborations with international partners. The application itself is limited to US institutions. I have to go back and check whether foreign components are allowed. I doubt that for UE5 applications, we allow foreign components, but feel free to send me an email with that question. Nate. Once again, nice to see you here too, uh, but I can get you a more definite answer to that, but I somehow think that this is limited to US institutions. Um, educational funding announcements quite commonly have a US institution limitation on it. Okay, and our next question is if the grant would support the creation of non-credit courses. For example, they're interested in creating an online intensive that will train undergraduates in bioinformatics and cloud computing. The answer to that is just as it stands in the chat here, I feel that that may not end up being responsive but we have had some discussions on things like summer courses that students would sign up for. L let's take that offline and see if I can get you a more definitive answer. But in general, this is designed for classical for credit during the semester traditional instruction that they would then use towards a degree associates undergraduate or masters. Great, our next question is if you expect that the soon to be identified Hub leader will have members of their team available whom they can reach out to and develop ideas in advance of submitting the site's application. So Andrew, wonderful question. The Hub awardee will be starting their work in a matter of days, but on the other hand, this funding announcement is also going to have a deadline within the next couple of months. So my hunch is that they would otherwise be excited to talk and discuss, but just because of the timing of this, they may not be in a position to put substantial time and effort given that they will just have received their award and barely be getting off the ground uh, in, in the next month or so. So feel free to connect with them. Uh, NNGRI will be doing a press release with the awardee name and contact information. So feel free to reach out and, and you know, let's see where it goes, but they're very new at this point themselves too. So I, I, have, I can't say that everything in the next couple of months will make sense to them in terms of how much time they can put on this. The next question asks if any of the platforms on the Anvil site are con considered to qualify as cloud resources like Terra, Galaxy, Jupyter, Seeker, et cetera. Yeah, Nick. Yes to all of those, as long as they're getting used on the Anvil. I mean, we know that Galaxy can be used as a web server as well, as can Jupyter, Seeker, and other things. So the specific point here is that we are looking for Anvil to be the educational tool. So if you're proposing use of Galaxy on the Anvil, Jupyter on the Anvil, Seeker on the Anvil, absolutely yes. But if you're proposing the use of Galaxy as a standalone tool, that would not count as a cloud usage um, requirement here. The next question asks, um, the faculty at the targeted institutions of this FOA usually have heavy teaching loads, so they will need release time during the academic year and or summer to carry out the proposed project if funded. So they were wondering if it would be possible to consider personnel costs in the budget. Jean-Fal, that's uh, very much in the plan. I mean, I encourage you to read the, read the budget piece of the funding announcement, but we are writing it in a way where there would definitely be partial salary support. Of course, it would be up to you to discuss with your institution what their requirements would be to release you from that extremely heavy teaching load, which we know is a nearly universal situation for teaching faculty. But go ahead and go through the funding announcement and tell me by email, if you will, if it covers your question in terms of you reaching a financial 
uh, agreement with your institution to do this work and teach one less course, for example. And we have a follow up on the cloud resources question. Can we expect Anvil to work with applicants on software support or should we expect um, focusing on existing data analysis pipelines? Oh yeah, the, the answer there is a clear and resounding yes. Uh, Anvil has uh, absolutely stellar outreach and training team uh, coming out of Johns Hopkins and the Hutch, Fred Hutch Institute at Seattle and Carnegie Institution in Baltimore. So feel free to reach out then. Anvil outreach team should be very, very willing to work with you would get included in your teaching activities. Next, we have a question about the minimum number of courses an application needs to develop. That is completely up to the applicant to tell us what they have in mind. We, we don't want to be too constrictive in how an individual applicant would decide to structure their application. Uh, if you want to combine two courses, one in genomic data science and one in Python programming, it's completely up to you. This is in the realm of reviewers to answer whether a particular applicant is proposing too much work or too little. Uh, it's really your decision to make. Great. It looks like we have a lull in the Q&A, but please feel free to add any other questions. Once again, my email uh, is in the public domain, or I'm happy to put it in the. All right, the chat is disabled here. But uh, if you Google my name, I'm sure my NGRI website will come up. Uh, program officers like me really, really enjoy having conversations with potential applicants. So this webinar is just a start. Uh, I'm happy to keep talking with any of you. A few more questions. Are any previous results needed? No, we have designed this application to say that uh, you know first time applicants are very, very welcome to apply. You can be completely new to the NIH application process or not have any results in terms of, uh, this is not an R01 where the reviewers are being asked to consider where there's preliminary data. If you teach and if you have a plan for using the cloud, uh, that should be fine. Janfa, I see your answer. Let's take that offline. I, I want to make sure that you and I are on the same page when uh, we talk about personal costs, because there might be a difference between what we are saying is support for the faculty member themselves versus support for personnel in the classical sense of a team of uh, you know programmers or cloud web servers or people that are not the PI themselves. We have another question about the budget limit. Yes, yeah, so this is capped at $150,000 uh, for individual awards. Uh, all, all of that is laid out in more you know, NIH financial detail within the funding announcement itself. So it, it lays out what would be covered in that budget, what would be not. So yeah, I, I don't know whether we had a name on that question, but if, if you, whoever is asking the budget question, I would advise going back and reading the funding announcement. And then if specific things don't make sense, me or one of my grants management colleagues here are happy to get back and give you more detail. Let's wait a few more minutes to see if others have questions on the webinar. If not, uh, thank you, everyone. 
We probably will also be trying to do a second webinar. If we succeed, that information will be on the website. Uh, you're not, it doesn't have to be that you're allowed to attend only one. You can come back and join the second one if we manage to do that as well. But otherwise my email address is in the chat. And uh, as I said, it really, really makes me happy to answer any questions. Uh, we hope that uh, if I leave any of you with the take home message, it would be that NIH funding is not just for labs that have already gotten previous awards or large institutions. If you have never ever applied for an NIH grant before, we designed this funding opportunity so that it is as simple, as streamlined as possible for a first time applicant. Minimum additional attachments, you know, minimum requirements from an administrative point of view. So if you are a teaching faculty member who has not previously thought of NIH as the home for your work, this might be a good starting point. Okay, Gerald, I will let you make a call on what we do in these cases, uh, unless other questions come in. I'm happy to stay online until the published time, which I think is two to three, or I don't know if in these cases, uh, Office of Communications usually ends a webinar early. It's but... really up to you, uh, Sherzo. Okay, let's so uh, let's wait till at least two forty in case any of you have questions in your mind that you haven't put in the Q and A yet. But uh, oh, Nate, here is something else from you. Oh yeah, th that's a good one. So we do want the work that we fund to be a meaningful part of the PI's workload. So what you see in there, Nate, when it says two point four months of PI effort is that sometimes NIH will set a minimum on how much time the PI has to spend on this work so that we know it's not one of a hundred things that they have going on. So that sort of gives you an idea for how much of the salary money you could put on this if you happen to have 50 different NIH awards, each of which is paying a little part of your salary. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to explain that this is sort of our way of making sure that we stay on the radar of the PI for this work to be important in the context of everything else they have going on. In terms of restrictions for allowable costs, I think once again, there are budget text lines in the funding announcement, which gives you the official NIH position. We can tell you what is allowed, you know, cloud computing costs, uh, costs for um, student research projects that would come out of the hub. But I think NIH also has language in the funding announcement that sort of makes it explicit what sort of costs are not allowed. Okay, this was extremely useful. We will hang around for another minute or so. Oh, Ned, you're on a roll here. Uh, Another question about research costs and if they can include support for students or if they are considered to be participants. No, the, I'll take the second part first. We are not considering students to be participants for this because at, at the end of the day, this is about students still being students and getting educational content other than the hands-on research project where they would work together. But NIH uses the word participants in a classical sense of uh, something like a workshop where someone registered and came for two weeks. So the students in this case are not considered to be participants. And in that sense, the money, the funding could not be used to support student time for participating in this activity. One other thing, because we had so many good questions at some point over the next few days, Sarah and I will be making sort of a frequently asked questions document and putting that on the website. Uh, but at any point, feel free to use email to send me additional questions. We will sort of make a little resource here so that people can see if the question they had in their mind has already been asked and answered. And that once again, will go on the website.
Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, once again, please keep an eye out on the website if any changes happen to either add a second webinar or change the due date, uh, we will be using the website and NIH also will be sending out through official channels. If that information goes out, uh, it will reach you through whatever ways you saw the initial notice of funding opportunity as well. Thank you. I hope many of you are curious and excited to apply. And, uh, you know, it, I never tired of saying this, but let's talk offline and let me help you put your application together. It's what the taxpayers fund me for. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gerald. I think we are good to close out today.